Okay now, so I wanna to talk to you about building for humans. And I'm going to totally fail Matt's bar for a good security talk. There is no math in here. But we are going to talk about humans, we are gonna go talk about failure, and so we are going to talk about the impacts of failure on humans, so please be aware that's in here. I wanted to start with some perspective. I wanna look at what you and literally every human you know mean in comparison to the rest of humanity. Here you are. Notice with this ginormous screen, you don't even fill in a pixel. There are 7.7 .7 billion people in the world. 4.4 billion of them are online. So if you're building for yourself and your family and your friends, you are missing just a huge swath of people. And why is that important? Edge cases. When I was an undergrad, we didn't think, hey, if I run a big computation, a bunch of computers are gonna break in the middle, right? These days, we plan for that. Edge cases are common at large scale. And the same thing is true of humans. At the scale Twitter's at, a one in a million chance happens 500 times a day. You want a bigger system with more users? If something happens to one in a million users once a year, at Google, that is best expressed as six times a day. You need to expect human edge cases because they are almost certainly much more common than you think. And the thing I want you to take away from this talk more than anything is respect. Respect is a positive feeling or action shown towards someone or something considered important or held in high esteem or regard. And it's also this process of honoring someone by exhibiting care, concern, or consideration for their needs and feelings. I think this is what we need to be building into technology because every human deserves respect. Failure matters because it affects humans. Your system has no meaning outside of humans. So I wanna talk about the intellectual challenges of doing this kind of work, some of the emotional challenges of doing this kind of work, and then some of the uh, organizational and company challenges. When you build for humanity, you need to understand and build for the people who are affected by your system, not just your users. Your users are easiest to identify because they're the ones talking to you, but there are lots of other people. Equifax sadly gave us a really good example of this because their users are financial institutions, but they sell your information, my information, lots of people's information. And when the hackers broke in and breached 150 million people's information, those people were affected by that system. And if you work on a big influential product, even more people are affected. And those effects can be mixed. They can be positive or negative or different effects in different places. For example, ride-sharing apps have decreased drunk driving in some places, but they have other effects on accessibility, labor markets, things like that. So why is this intellectually challenging? Turns out humans are way more complex than systems. If you want to say use PGP, I don't want to dunk on you PGP, but it has a usability curve like a brick wall, right? If you want to get your, your key signed, you have to follow this 34 step long set of directions, which is really complicated. It's complicated to me. I literally have a PhD in cryptography and it's complicated. If you wanna build a secure cryptographic protocol, that is really hard. But if you wanna build one that can actually be used, it turns out it's a lot harder. Part of the reason why it's hard is that different humans have contradictory needs and desires. For example, a bunch of people should not be sharing their real time location with their spouse because their spouse is abusive and is a physical problem. But there's other sets of people who need to share it for physical safety reasons. My husband shares his with me when he goes on long bike rides. Uh, people if, who are walking home through dangerous neighborhoods might wanna have a friend virtually follow along. In order to understand this, we have to do threat modeling all the way from humans in the societies they build all the way down to the hardware. So when I do that, I think about three things. I think about targets. And I think about all of my affected parties and I think about different sorts of life circumstances that will make them vulnerable in different ways. For example, they might be an invisible minority, like an LGBT plus person. They might be experiencing a disability, like limited sight, hearing, or fine motor control, or, dis or poverty, or abuse, right? One in four women and one in nine men in the US, I don't have figures for other genders, in the US experience extreme domestic violence over the course of their lifetime. These people are your users. They are affected by your systems. You just don't know who they are. Or somebody with a secret. I live my life 
pretty openly, but when I started having a miscarriage at work, I did not want to have that conversation with my coworkers. I suddenly had a secret, even though I had not planned to have one. And then I move on to thinking about attackers. And I like to think about attackers by thinking about what they want. Do they have a commercial objective? They want to sell something. A criminal objective? They want to commit fraud or another crime. A political objective? They want to change the world. A malicious objective, where they want to hurt someone or a group of people. Maybe they just like chaos. And attackers come with bonus features that make them even more dangerous. So think about insider attackers. They have privileged access to the inside of your system, usually because they're an employee. Like uh, Twitter had an engineer suborned by the Saudi government who exfiltrated data on their targets. Intimate attackers, people like an untrustworthy roommate who have privileged access to your personal life. A power figure, somebody who has power over you, like maybe your employer. And then you can mash up a bunch of features like this to make ex attacker profiles which are particularly relevant to your system. So for example, um, advanced intimate persistent threat. Up to 40% of law enforcement officers commit domestic violence at some point, and the targets of that domestic violence tend to have less recourse because the perpetrator has more access to the courts and to information, right? That's a good threat model. Think about suppressing political dissidents in an untargeted way. In the wake of a coup, the Turkish government decided, hey, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna arrest everyone who uses a particular chat app. And the people who use the chat app and the dissidents, I mean, they overlapped, but they were not the same group, right? Also, they arrested 10,000 people who didn't even have the chat app because they got confused, but that was 50,000 people. You know, don't assume that your attackers have necessarily thought things through all the way. And then you wanna look at the system. Look at how the pieces of the system connect, how information flows, what happens if this fails? What happens if this fails? What happens if they both fail at once? And then you want to look at the pieces of the system which are particularly important for respectful operation. So for example, information sharing. I don't know, every place a user can share information with another user. Do they understand what's going on? How do they make it stop? Does it actually stop when they tell you to? Also you want to look at things like automated decision making. What are your false positives and false negatives and everything from your recommendation algorithms to an autopilot? What happens if it's working correctly? So people have thought an awful lot, hey, Facebook is targeting ads by listening to me through my phone. And people have done a bunch of app teardowns on the Facebook app, so we don't think that's what's happening. But it is fascinating that we are still having this conversation after years and years. That tells you that there's a difference between correct and right, right? The ad system is spitting out something which is very much correctly related to you. Creepily so, right? But it doesn't mean it's a good product experience. Look at the places where you have two systems meet. People tend to look at systems in isolation and say, oh, this one works, this one works, and then you put them together and something bad happens in the middle. So then you take all of those things and you mash them up and you create yourself some really high octane nightmare fuel, right? All of this stuff is ever changing, it's ever developing, it will never ever be boring. So I wanna talk about the emotional challenges as well, because we don't talk about this part enough. Why is doing this kind of work emotionally challenging? Well, for one, people are gonna yell at you if they're not happy. As the formal global lead for privacy technology at Google, I promise you, people will tell you when they're unhappy. And it's really important that you listen to them if you're trying to build a system for them. They may not be right about what the system does, they may not be right about how it's affecting them, but they are telling you that it is un making them unhappy and that's really important for you to hear. Also, there's a lot of ambiguity. There are no clear right answers in this space. And to make good choices, you have to understand how real people are being really hurt. And it turns out that that's even harder when you consider the future. It's much less predictable than the present. Back in the 90s, we had this thing called the white pages. And in there was a big book that they handed out to everybody that had people's names and addresses and phone numbers. And there was this really big threat model in the day which was bad pizza. That somebody would call up and have terrible pizza delivered to your house and the pizza guy was gonna be super pissed that you didn't wanna pay for it. That was your big threat model. Nowadays, one of your bigger threat models is called swatting. And swatting is where somebody calls up the police and says, hello police, Leah is currently murdering me right now in her house, and you should show up to her house with many guns. 
And the police get, unsurprisingly, kind of excited about this, and they come over to my house with many, many guns. And when you have excited people with many, many guns, this is very dangerous. People have been shot. People have been killed by the actual police in real life. And if you're uncomfortable right now, I want you to sit with that feeling. Because here's the thing. It's really easy to look away. But to order to make good choices, you have to understand the impact. And if you turn away, or you choose not to make those choices, it doesn't mean that the choices don't get made. It means that the choices don't get made by somebody who cares, by somebody who understands. Somebody will still make those choices, but they won't be necessarily as good. And there's something in our community that I think is a real problem in doing this sort of work, which is that we prize purity. And that if we're gonna work with humans, this is really, really messy. We prize systems with clean lines and maximum protection. The only correct way to send a message is end-to-end -end encrypted through artisanal mix nets with keys signed by Edward Snowden. <laughs> but the pure choices, when we make them in our systems, they may not serve our users. We're trying to support people. We're, we want journalists to be doing their work. We want human rights workers to be doing their work. We want parents and teachers and everybody to be able to do their work. And they, it turns out they have, they have work to do. They have lives, they have families, they don't have time. But also, that encrypted computation I just mentioned would stand out like a beacon to oppressive governments. When we make certain kinds of pure system choices, they may not serve people. So now I wanna talk about some of the company challenges, the organizational challenges. What happens if your company is the one getting in the way? And sometimes there are legitimate constraints. If I had an infinite amount of money, let me tell you, I would be doing more user research than I am doing right now, given that I work at a startup. But sometimes also the right answer is don't build that system, but a lot of times it isn't. We have managed to spread so much art and knowledge and science and culture that we just would not have access to otherwise. My children can talk to their sick grandparents in another country. Right? We have built a lot of things that are good, and when we build something, we take risks, and when we don't build something, we also take risks. But sometimes, legitimately, your company is getting in the way of you doing respectful work. I want to declare my bias here. I think that in the long term, building respectful systems is going to win, because power governs so much of how humans interact with each other, right? and people are going to seek to level out structural inequality. We can see this over and over and over again in human societies. Medieval carnival, sac sacrifices of the king. And the same thing holds for companies. That drive for reciprocity, I can touch you, you can touch me back, is part of the push to regulate the tech industry. And as engineers, it can be really confusing. Somebody proposes regulation, you're like, well, you said you wanted this thing, but it, doesn't, it looks like it's gonna do this other thing entirely. But all of these pieces of regulation, they serve this drive towards reciprocity. So I think respect is gonna win. If you wanna build respectful systems and you don't feel like you're doing enough of that already, how do you make that happen? The first thing you can do is help your company understand and prioritize respect. Tie what you're suggesting to doing to what an executive wants. The executive probably wants happy users. The executive probably wants gov uh, governments and regulators not to yell at them or shut them down. If possible, quantify what you're doing. So I worked with a team that was building a new product to replace an old product. And when they launched this product to great acclaim, we looked at the user feedback. The user feedback for the new product had the privacy complaints dropped through the floor. And we could quantify that, and we can use that to argue for doing more work of that sort in the future. But, you know, it's a messy world, and we can't quantify a huge amount of what we do. So, you can be demonstrably right. If you are demonstrably right, you will be trusted in the future. So, for example, I worked with the team, and they wanted to launch a feature. And I said, I have Spidey Sense right now, and uh, I don't think this is going to go well. And they said, well, if you don't know what's gonna go well, Probably it'll be fine, and, you will, we, and then they went ahead and launched it. And, um, TLDR, uh, we ended up serving porn on a clothing manufacturer's website. 
And let me tell you, the next time I went to those VPs and said, I have Spidey sense, they were like, no, we are not launching whatever you say not to launch, right? I was demonstrably right a, a number of times, and they said, OK, we, we are going to trust your judgment now. Another thing that's really useful is remembering that how you eat an elephant is one bite at a time. In a big company, you usually can't change everything at once, even if you are the CEO. So make something better. Make a couple things better. Work with some teams. And then you will get cheerleaders. VP cheerleaders are super helpful. All those VPs I talked about working with, they were like, oh, yeah, I want to build a good system. It has to be respectful. And then they went and told all their VP buddies about it, and it was super, super helpful when rolling that out further. The second option here is to use your flexibility to design and build better where you are. Think about respect in small ways. What happens if somebody's going to be unhappy about this recommendation I'm putting in front of them? How should we build the system for that? Or you think about it in bigger ways. How do we redo our monetization model so that we need less data? How can I make this real-time location sharing feature work respectfully in a world that includes intimate partner abuse and stalking? Right? The team that did that at Google, it was the one feature team. They said, this is important, and they worked on it, and they made something really great. The third option is that you can vote with your feet. You can choose to use your skills to build respectful tech. And I want to make really sure here that you understand what I'm saying. Being asked to make hard choices is not the same thing as not being able to make good choices. In a world that has humans, in a there is always going to be hard choices. There is not one human good, and they trade off against each other in unpredictable ways. Security, privacy, privacy for different sorts of people, anti-abuse, availability, all, there's so many, many, many things, and they all trade off. But I want to recognize that most of us have choices. We are in demand, we have a lot of privilege, and we can choose to, root, to work on respectful systems. You can change products if you want. You can change your job. And here's the thing. It can be good for you to do that if you feel like you're trapped in where you are, because you can look yourself in the eye in the mirror in the morning. But here's the other thing. It is good for the ecosystem. If we, as a field, choose to work on respectful systems, that sends a real message. And the reason why is because if you run a company, the thing you have to pay attention to more than anything else is hiring and retention. And so if you uh, are building a respectful system, and that becomes a competitive advantage. That means boards and VCs will put a lot of pressure on companies to go and move in that direction. And at Huma, we've made building with respect a hiring pro part of our hiring process. So I want you to build for humans. It is not pure. It is really messy. But it is all of our responsibility, including every one of you here. You can learn how intellectually. Think about real-world threats and ameliorations. It will never be boring. It's always changing. And you can learn the emotional part. Learn how to make decisions in the presence of feelings of uncertainty and discomfort. It doesn't mean you're doing a bad job. It means that it's hard. And you can make these choices even if your company is hindering you. You can help them understand and prioritize respect. You can build better where you are. And if you need to, you can vote with your feet. Thank you.